Amorite.com because they're cursed by Amorite. Or they have too much opulence and they don't want to risk it. Or Aparada um, Uta, they have some offenses and they're suffering on account of offenses. We went over the offenses in chapter 8 of uh, Nectar of Devotion. There's a long list of offenses. The offenses are uh, the 10 offenses to the Holy Name. And then there's a whole bunch of offenses in deity worship. And then there's offenses to devotees. And especially offenses to pure devotees are very, very serious. And they will block our devotional service. Even if we have done a lot of service, if we commit an offense to a devotee, that can block our getting the results of our service until that offense is cleared. Uh, so even though the holy name is uh, so powerful and anyone who chants the holy name will certainly get the result of their chanting, that result will be delayed until we counteract or nullify our offenses. Whether the offense to the holy name, offense to the devotees, or offense to the deities, uh, any offenses that we make, even offenses to other living entities, are counted against us until we rectify them. So this is a very important uh, area of our life that we have to work on. And finally, there's bhakti utta. That means suffering arising in relation to bhakti. Now, how is that possible? Bhakti is supposed to be all auspicious. Uh, it's supposed to be the uh, source of all transcendental pleasure and happiness. So how can it be that we would suffer in relation to bhakti? Well, it's very simple. Uh, we can commit offenses or we can try to use bhakti to get something else, something material. Uh, for example, it's well known that the holy name is a desire tree and whatever you desire while chanting the holy name certainly will manifest. But what people don't understand is that that's also an offense to the holy name because the real purpose of the holy name is not to entangle us in material activities but to free us from them. So if we try to use the holy name to attain some material objective, whether it's wealth or relief from dis some kind of distress or um, fame or power or, you know, anything like that, um, this, is a, this is a mistake. And especially if we cultivate this desire deliberately, then it's really, really serious offense. Now, it's a fact. In order to do our engagement, for example, in order to preach effectively, a certain amount of fame is necessary, a certain amount of knowledge is necessary, even a certain amount of money is necessary for effective preaching. Huh? If you, if you, uh, you know, tuned into our class and like we're dressed in rags, you know, and living under a tree somewhere, you know, I don't know how we would afford a camera, but <laughs> let's say, you know, somehow or other, uh, you wouldn't be very impressed, would you? You know, so we have to have clean clothes. We have to keep our health. We have to have a nice facility, a nice house, good equipment and all that just for preaching. For practicing devotional service, we certainly don't need any of that. Uh, but because we've taken on this particular service of preaching, we have to have a certain amount of fame, but not too much fame. Uh, for example, uh, even if we had the chance to accept many, many disciples, we're not going to do it. We're going to accept as many disciples as we can handle, as many disciples as we can help. And beyond that, we're not going to accept more. Uh, because it's very dangerous. If you accept a disciple, you have to take some portion of their karma. Uh, any leader does, but especially a spiritual master. Uh, so, you know, we can't take too many disciples or, you know, we wouldn't, we wouldn't be able to function. So uh, that has to be avoided. You see, you have to know your capacity. You have to know your limits. 
and not transgress those limits. But when we see some devotees, they get carried away. They start taking lots and lots of disciples, or they start using their devotional position for fame and, uh, you know, to get favors from, the, from their disciples and to collect a lot of donations and like that. And uh, all this leads to fall down. It all leads to trouble. It all leads to suffering. And this is called bhakti utta. It's suffering due to the misuse of bhakti itself. See? So as we have been going through these different anartas, it started out pretty gross, you know, being attached to material things and stuff like that. Everybody can understand that these are sins. Huh? But now we're getting into the kind of more subtle anartas. It's very difficult to tell, for example, whether a devotee is using a little bit of fame for a devotional service or if they're misusing their fame for some material enjoyment. How are you going to know? Well, the answer is it's not really any of your business. <laughs> But it's between that living entity and Krishna. Uh, but still, it's good to be able to see the signs or symptoms of this because it usually results in fall down sooner or later. That devotee is going to have trouble on the path of devotional service and they're probably going to fall down or have some other difficulties. Uh, so it's probably a good thing not to be in too close association with them. You see? So, uh, for example, my god brothers, I hate to bring this up, but I have to, uh, they got into, into too much politics. They collected a lot of money, and they got kind of carried away with the power thing, and they formed a very closed clique, and uh, then they started doing power politics with their other god brothers and the other members of the mission. And this ruined everything. Uh, because of misuse of the, the position and power that they got from their bhakti. I mean, some of these guys were made uh, regional directors of whole huge areas of the world when they were like 20, 22, 23 years old. Huh? I know Hridayananda Maharaj, for example, was made the, the GBC secretary for South America when he was like 20 years old. You know, 20 years old. I go to, to colleges sometimes and I see people who are 20 years old and they look like kids. Well, they are kids. Most of them are still, you know, uh, their whole existence is being paid for by their parents and so on like that. They never worked a day in their life. They're kids, school children uh, at that age. And yet this guy at, at the age of 20 was in charge of something like 10 temples, you know, three or four hundred devotees in South America. And he didn't even speak Spanish. He had to learn Spanish. <laughs> well, fortunately, he was pretty quick, but still, try to understand. These men were given these positions out of necessity way, way before they were actually ready for them, just out of Srila Prabhupada's mercy. Yeah? And out of, out of necessity, there was a need. There were so many devotees, and there were very, very few advanced. I'm afraid, frankly, the same thing's going to happen in our group if we grow too fast. So I'm working on ways to get rid of people. <laughs> 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 I'm really good at that, you know. They call me here, they call me the freak out Acharya. <laughs> so. Uh, and it's not that we don't want, we, we do want to help people, but we realize that we have limits. Huh? We, we can't help too many people. We could help a whole lot of people a little bit, or we can help a few people a whole lot. Which is better? I choose the second one. I would rather take 10 people and train them all the way up to full, uh, pure devotional service, full enlightenment, full self-realization, 
than take a hundred disciples or a thousand disciples and give each one just a little bit. Why? Because the ones with just a little bit are not going to be able to go on and uh, continue this mission. See? Whereas if I have even one disciple who has full self-realization, he can go on and take this mission on to the next generation. And maybe later on it will become a mass thing. Right now the people aren't ready for it. Huh? Although I think that's going to change soon. I think people are going to start to finally lose faith in the Western materialistic society. Huh? I lost faith in it about 40 years ago, personally. <laughs> uh, other people are a little bit uh, behind. Uh, so we see 